the next thing that we need to do is start looking at how individual markets might be structured, particularly with labor. And you may see, you will probably see, a free response question dealing with a labor market of some kind. So, if we're talking about labor markets, and the price for labor is the wage. If we're talking about wages, then you need to keep in mind the difference between nominal wages and real wages. Remember that nominal is the amount of money that a worker is actually being paid. While a real wage takes into account the inflation that is happening at the same time. So that the real wage is in effect the buying power of the nominal wage. So this is the money that you're getting in a paycheck versus what can you actually do in terms of spending it. And as you may have noticed with gas prices going up, which is making everything else more expensive as the energy price affects everything that's moved using energy, you're losing buying power. So when we're talking about wages, you may see something with this just in terms of difference between nominal and real. Nominal, what do we see today? Real, what does that mean when we take inflation into account? Now, in terms of what a labor market actually looks like, if we have a perfectly elastic demand for labor, and remember the price is going to be the wage, or you might just put P slash W so that we know what you're talking about, and quantity would be perhaps the number of workers and the number of man hours being supplied depending on how your problem is set up. In a perfectly competitive labor market, okay, pulling in the ideas that we had from the last unit, That's where you might see a horizontal demand or something approaching perfectly competitive would be more horizontal than vertical. Because remember, a perfectly competitive market is not that realistic, but for the sake of illustration, we have things that will approach perfect competition more than the imperfect competition that we've already seen. So if we have a flat demand for labor, then that also means that that's our price line. Now, supply we can add in. Supply, remember, is going to be upward sloping. Demand is going to come from the firm. Supply is going to come from the household. So their equilibrium quantity is going to be determined by that intersection. So for this model, this would be the labor market facing the individual firm. Okay? This is for the firm. Now, why does supply slope up? Because in order to attract workers away from other jobs or from college, for example, if you want people to quit school and come to work, you've got to offer them more money, perhaps, because they're not going to be pulled from things that could be, in their minds, better long-term opportunities. So to get more labor, you have to pay more for it. So higher prices, higher quantities. As you move up the price line, you move along the quantity line. Okay, so that's what you have to do to attract 
more people into the labor market, market or get them to work harder and work more hours. Now, demand facing the market, or facing the, the entire industry rather, is not going to be flat like this. The market demand is going to slope down. So this is demand for the firm. This is demand for the industry. Now, why does demand for the industry slope down? Because you have diminishing marginal returns from your resource. Meaning that as you continue to employ more of one resource, eventually you're going to have the amount of your total product decreasing. Your workers are going to be tripping over each other. We've talked about that in terms of um, cost to the firm before. So for an individual firm, you could have a flat demand. But for the industry, it's going to slow down. 